I, of course, as a young cinephile, heard about Jelly Mirzilnik uh, already as a teenager, but I really became properly introduced to his work when in 2000, or maybe 2001, I cannot remember now, we organized a complete retrospective of his films at the Slovenian Cinematheque in Ljubljana, where I worked at that time. And this was also a year in which Christine Dolhofer, who was at that time the director of the Diagonale Film Festival, organized a complete retrospective or a large homage to Jelly Mirzilnik in Graz. And I remember that we were driving from Ljubljana to Graz at that time, literally smuggling film prints from Austria to Slovenia, because at that time the borders were still very much there. Um, and I was working both on the retrospective and uh, on the catalog of the retrospective. I met Jelly Mirzilnik, obviously, I was deeply impressed by what I saw. And this was the beginning of, let's say, my engagement with him because we became friends and then we continued to meet at film festivals. I showed his films on several occasions. But this point in time, about 20 years ago, was the first time, yeah. I will admit that when I first encountered films by Jelly Mirzilnik, I was shocked because nothing in my upbringing as a cinephile has prepared me for his very specific type of cinema. I mean, I've seen political films before. I was familiar with the notions of cinema povero. Um, I was aware or at least vaguely aware of the history of uh, Yugoslavian cinema, but still to be encountered with um, a voice uh, that is so distinct and so strong, um, a voice that pays so little attention to the things which filmmakers usually consider incredibly important. Like for Jelly Mirzilnik, uh, the question of film form is basically a bourgeois question. He needs to do something and he will do it by any means necessary. If he can shoot on 35 millimeter, okay, he will. If not, he will use 16 millimeter or eight millimeter or video. The, 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 the means are irrelevant. What he wants to do is something else. He, I mean, I'm speculating a little bit now, but not that much because he himself is always very vocal about these things. He doesn't see himself as much as an artist as he does himself simply as a part of society. Um, I remember I was deeply, deeply both shocked and impressed when, um, when I first met him 20 years ago, I asked him um, what is the most difficult part of making films the way you make them, and he laughed and he said that uh, perhaps the most difficult, not in the sense that it would annoy him, but it just takes a lot of time. The most difficult part is the fact that once you go out into the world and once you make films with a certain group of people that are left voiceless by the system, they stay in your life. As a politically engaged filmmaker, you're not simply allowed to encounter a group of unemployed people, migrants, make a film with them, and then move on to your brilliant next project, the way most political filmmakers and artists unfortunately do. No, for Jelly Mirzilnik, this means that these people stay in your life. So if you once made a film, about um, a person like Kennedy, who was violently deported from Germany back to Yugoslavia, where he had no home, he stays in your life. People in his films are never subjects of, of, of his gaze. They are his equals. Um, and I think that in, in, in this regard, he brilliantly resolves um, several problems that have been pestering uh, the idea of political cinema. Um, what was that famous quote by, by Godard, uh, who asked himself this big question, um, that the question is not how to make political films, but how to make films politically. And then there were big discussions everywhere, how to make films politically. For Gilles Mergilin, this comes naturally. If you want to make a film about unemployed people, you bring them over to your apartment. And then at some point, yes, you throw them out. And these are the really, really harsh uh, decisions one has to make. So in a certain sense, I don't think that there is a more ethical filmmaker or artist working today than Jeremy Zilnik. 
I mean, I mentioned this before when I said that he doesn't care about these things, that something else is more important for him. So everything in his films is in the service of his primary idea, which is, I would say, yes, giving voice to, 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 to certain voiceless people. Um, so the elements of form come secondary, which doesn't mean that they're not interesting. They always are supremely interesting. I mean, what he has done um, in the field of mixing fiction and documentary has yet to be surpassed by, by any filmmaker. So Kennedy trilogy uh, that I wrote about is a wonderful example uh, because it, it began as a more or less traditional documentary film. And if you look at the first film, uh, Kennedy Savracha Kuchi, this, this, this could pass for a straightforward fly on the wall documentary film in which we have somebody who guides us through the film. And then in that process, Jelly Mirjilnik realized, I mean, he knew that before, that in order to, um, let's say, achieve a certain truthfulness, you don't necessarily have to uh, work within the purely documentary dispositive. You can also stage something. And, and reach the same level of truth. So at the end of the trilogy, we have arrived at the point where the last film is pure fiction, but in a certain sense, gives us just as much information about this character and is as truthful about his life and what he has to go through in life as the first film, which was pure documentary. And that I think is a magical ability of Jelenir, that he's able to improvise on the spot and so swiftly move from these um, you know, different layers and levels of discourse, documentary, fiction. I mean, it's irrelevant uh, in the final consequence uh, in his films. And that, again, is something that's so fantastic about him, that, that the usual notions of this is fiction, this is documentary, are just irrelevant. Just like it is irrelevant whether he shoots on film or on video, um, or if the budget of his film is like this or like that, what matters is something else. I had something else in mind when I wrote that text, and I don't believe in that anymore, <laughs> but I do think that there's something very, very important when it comes to the relationship between Jelly Mirzilnik and the audience. Um, and it's again something that makes Jelly Mirzilnik unique, and that is that filmmakers, not only filmmakers, artists in general, are all attempting to seduce their audience in one way or another. Even the most formally rigorous, austere filmmaker there is, is still seducing their audience, even if they're appealing only to a very small group of audience who will buy into these harsh aesthetics, still they are doing something seductive. You know, when Belatar is making his nine hour long films, beautifully shot, he is seducing a certain element of the audience with this. Uh, when Hollywood people are making their blockbusters, they're seducing the audience. Jelly Mirzilnik never does that. He never, at least that's my impression, maybe he would disagree, but I think that he never does anything in his film that would be there to seduce us into liking his films. Um, he, he, he truly, each film he makes is one with the subject of the film. There are no concessions that he would make. For example, he would never say, oh, I will cut this out now to make the film more attractive. No. And that, I think, is, um, that means that he respects the audience to the point where he's doing nothing to seduce them. You know? Right now we're talking and I'm trying to sound all elaborate because I'm trying to seduce the audience. Zilnik wouldn't care about that. He would laugh, he would fart, he would talk for one hour. He doesn't need to seduce anybody because the subject at hand is so important for him. So that's what I would say is the essence of his relationship with the audience. My contribution is very minimal. I basically only served as a translator of um, Jeremy Zilnik's own story about his cinematic influences into a certain uh, small video essay. Um, I was invited by the wonderful curators of this retrospective to think about J.L. Imaginik in the context of film history, which I think is a tremendously interesting subject because his films are so outstanding that very often when people write about them, they kind of fail to properly situate him within the context of film history other than 
saying that he makes political films. Um, and his films do belong to film history, but instead of dreaming about uh, this subject, uh, I said, well, let's just ask Jelimir Zilnik and see what he has to say, because I know for a fact that Jelimir Zilnik um, is a passionate cinephile. Um, I, I, I was uh, sitting on a jury with him once uh, of a film festival, and I remember we had wonderful heated discussions, and he watches films, and he has wonderful opinions about other films. So I simply asked him if he would um, care about thinking about his own film career in the context of film history. Now, the interesting thing is that usually when you ask this question, filmmakers get nervous because they, they, they feel that, you know, I stand above film history. How dare you uh, think of me? But Jelly Medjilnik, in his uh, typically generous manner, instantly started discussing at length which films he saw as a child, which films he saw as a teenager, which films he saw as a grown-up person, how they influenced him. Um, and, and, and he delivered this beautiful 10-page-long uh, letter chronicling in great details how, how his films correspond with the film history. And this is now uh, this uh, video essay that's on display as part of the exhibition. How much? Oh, that's too long for internet, huh? Ah, okay.